Uh, hello, everybody. I'm here with uh, William Miller, producer of The Territory, uh, uh, a documentary which will be screened on EU film, film, Human Rights Film Days. Uh, hello, Will. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this interview. Uh, just before we start, I just want to give a little information about Will. Uh, Will Miller is a documentary filmmaker and co-founder of Documus, a production company based in New York City and Toronto. His work focuses on environmental conflict, migration, and human rights. He has worked in over 30 countries and speaks English, Spanish fluently, as well as Portuguese and French conversationally. Miller studied environmental sciences at University. His research focused on historical settlement patterns in Napo River Valley and Peruvian Amazon, as well as the land loss and displacement of the Embra indigenous community by the Alto Bayano hydroelectric dam in Panama. Uh, the territory is the first feature film Miller has produced. So, uh, do you want to add anything else to this information? That's already more than enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, great, and welcome again. So, Will, first of all, I just wanted to uh, know how uh, this project uh, evolved and how uh, did you uh, be part of this project? How did it start the, all this journey? The project began with the director, Alex, who's a childhood friend of mine. We've been working together and run a production company together where he he had been inspired by the work of Nigenia, um, the main um, activist you see in the film. And he had approached her as the Brazilian elections in 2016, where you were, we were watching the ascent of Bolsonaro and the way that his very, you know, angry rhetoric around the Amazon was making a lot of people worried. And so Alex reached out to Nigenia first, just saying, I'm a huge fan of your work. Both he and I both studied environmental science and he had just had a different idea for a different film and approached her, uh, you know, just he was interested in getting to see what her reality would look like under Bolsonaro. She she connected him with Gabriel, who was the other producer, um, who's based in the Amazon. And it started out as one thing, but she really just was saying, if you want to follow me around, this to me is the Uruwawawaw are one of the most vulnerable and they are one of the most, and they have the biggest land. This is what I'm focused on. And so she was the one who originally made the introduction. And, right, and we were there right when Bolsonaro rose to power and immediately saw the effects. On the 10th day of his presidency was that first invasion that you see in the film, which kicks everything off. And they were just under a complete onslaught of pressure from all sides. And so it was in that context that we started conversations around the idea of making a film with them. And that took months of conversations and it was a long process, but that's kind of how it all started. Yeah, I also wanted to ask about that too. Uh, there are lots of parts in the film, I guess, uh, which uh, they shot too, right? They uh, gathered a media uh, in a way, they uh, created their own media and they started to shoot to, um, give people information throughout the Amazon to tell them what's happening out there. So uh, there's a large part of their contribution to this documentary, right? Can you yeah, just... the film is a, is a co-production with the community. So we, the, the community is, you see the logo at the beginning of the film, they own the, the film ownership, I think has many different meanings you know, everything from decision-making all the way down to the finances and to the business decisions, but also the benefit. And so for us, it was always really critical to kind of understand the historical context of and of this place and this community and how much had been stolen from them and in many ways not perpetuate those cycles of exploitation from people who looked like me and Alex, who are both white, outside, foreign filmmakers and you know, there's a long history of people even trying with every best intention um, coming in and inadvertently being exploitative. And so for us, you know, we we took a, a number of steps to kind of slowly understand how this could work. And so basically, very early on, there was a, I'll just give you an anecdote just to give you a sense of, of how this community works and thinks. Um, 
everything is done in the Uruwa tradition by consensus. And everyone, there are six different villages and everyone has to get together and there has to be a unanimous consensus before any decision can move forward. And people from every village have to be represented and be able to all agree before anything can be decided. And so we were just very early days. We were there for a community meeting that was about this linguist who was visiting. He was from an American university and he wanted to help write down the language so that they could teach it in schools and, and, and protect their, their language. The elders got together and over the course of several hours talked and they came back and said, no, you know, we know what happens when people like you come, what's going to happen. You're promising all these nice things, but what's going to happen is that if you write down the language, you will own it. And then we will have to pay you just to talk. And that was a really interesting and important realization for us about how, how much had been stolen. And if we were going to make this film together, they would have to own their own story and they would have to own the way that the film was made. And so early days, Alex and myself have a, a background in participatory filmmaking projects. So we'd done a lot of work with everything from artistic expression to evidence collection with human rights defenders. And so we had brought down some little cameras and we started a process of just like opening up the filmmaking process and making it more shared because many of the elders in particular had like never seen a movie and like a feature length film and never seen one and so how are you supposed to explain what it is um and how it works if they never if they don't have that familiarity and so if you think about informed consent like how can you have informed consent if you don't know so we, it was important to us that we just started a process of like we'll interview you you interview us we can see how we can edit those things together they can see the power of filmmaking. We started watching some movies together, started doing breakdowns of clips, how some about indigenous people in Brazil. How are people, how are outsiders looking at indigenous people through this sort of historical uh, cinema? And that started a whole process of just these workshops. And independent of all of that, Bita Day started to really own uh, the, the kind of hallmark of his leadership, independent of us was bringing in connectivity. He was bringing in drones, he was bringing in cameras, he was bringing in all of these tools to help their evidence collection for land defense. So their land defense teams were using these tools and he was hustling and writing grant applications and getting support completely independent of us. And so what happened was when COVID hit and we were not allowed to go into the community, uh, because it was like, you send us better cameras like these cameras are like kind of toys like we want real stuff we see what you guys are filming with send us that and send us better microphones send us like you know we want to finish this movie ourselves and so we really leaned into that and they were they were acting as the main production company and so you know obviously it was important that we reflected that and so they own you know they own as much of the film as any other production company as much as my production company they benefit from it um, and I think it's been really amazing to see how the media team that came up around making this film is also going to continue into the future. We're collectively with the community, uh, part of our impact work, we're building a, a cultural center in Bitete's village. It'll be a big building with also a multimedia kind of production hub inside of it. So it'll be editing stations, be a podcasting station for recording stuff. There'll be more equipment, more cameras. We just got a donation for three really nice cinema cameras. Um, and we're just basically trying to build out a home base for their production team and uh, hopefully looking forward to seeing all the films that they make. Well, that's great. I think that there is a re great relationship that uh, you uh, develop between two different communities because uh, I guess you gained their trust and also uh, you gave uh, them a real power that they can use you gave them a media power and you you just um, maybe in a way show them a new way for them to defend themselves and to represent themselves so i guess it's it's a really great relationship between uh, two different communities uh, and yeah and i and i learned you know i think it's i think it sometimes feels wrong to say like we help them because honestly like the film is so much stronger because of what they shot. They're they have an incredible ability to capture their environment, like no outsider ever will be able to. But at the same time, I think 
we learned a lot about the decision making process about that consensus based um, approach where everyone is already you have these long conversations and everyone works together ahead of time when things get bad things get hard when tragedy strikes you're so much tighter as a team um already you don't have to like figure out if you trust people you already have a really strong relationship to fall back on and so i would say you know i'm excited i think they, they've in many ways used this platform to get of this bigger message about the way that they're protecting their land and how that's important for the whole world. Um, but I also think that, you know, that was happening with us or without us. And I, it was a privilege to be part of it. I don't know how much we uh, changed that, in fact. Uh, I guess the, uh, the both parties co uh, uh, con contributed a lot uh, in a way. And, uh, like I said, the, the most successful thing in here is I guess that friendship that uh, trust between these uh, two groups never lived uh, with each other before but now maybe they're really really stronger by like you said by by the difficult uh, roads you take while, while trying to create this project uh, you all gathered together and became uh, stronger so I think it's a great collaboration. I hope. Uh, I hope it, it will continue for both parties. And uh, I. I also wanted to uh, give a little information to people who still haven't watched the documentary. Uh, Uru Iwowo uh, community is a indigenous community uh, which lives in Amazon. And uh, unfortunately, like many indigenous communities, their home is this the, the constructed uh, the construction of the forest and uh, invasion of their lands uh, threaten them their houses and uh, their world and uh, it's it started to get harder for for them to breathe uh, in a house they always lived in so that's how uh, all the, all the communities started to in a way uh, gather together and wanted to uh, fight for their rights uh, which has been that their rights for all these years. So I just wanted to give that uh, information to it a little, little bit. And also, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, in a way, we talked about how the documentary had an impact on this community, but also I wanted to ask you, how would uh, this documentary have an impact for people who watch this documentary or involved with this documentary? Uh, what kind of uh, developments or changes uh, do you think will happen? I have, it has been an absolute joy, also not just working obviously on the film, but working on making the film have a lasting legacy and impact mm -hmm. for other communities, for other indigenous communities, for the Amazon in general. There's a few, you know, we were operating under a lot of tension and lack of cooperation from the Brazilian government under Bolsonaro. Yeah. And so there were a number of laws that were happening, um, a lot of different legal pushes through the courts and through the judiciary, I mean, through the judiciary and through the legislative that we were trying to fight against, but it was always really hard to make a lot of progress in Brazil during Bolsonaro. What we looked at was other levers of power that would have, be able to also have influence over the Amazon that we did see some kind of potential for forward movement. So and the big thing that we focused on was this law in the European, uh, the European Union level, the European Parliament, that would basically make it so that anyone who was importing goods from forest, forested areas, in particular from the Amazon, would be responsible for those supply chains. So if there was illegal deforestation in their supply chains or they were getting goods, say it was beef from a uh, Waterhouse that was raising cattle on Uruguay land, for example, we were able to trace. There was first an initiative in France, so we were able to trace that beef, literally every single step as it got on trucks, you know, into these illegal slaughterhouses and got all the way every single step into French grocery stores, and we were able to get a settlement with that grocery store chain and have them stop getting supplies, and that inspired a bigger legislation at the EU level to do that across all of Europe. And so the way that um, we approached it was we had a series of meetings with the countries that were sponsoring this regulation. Um, Chai Sudui, who's the executive producer, the daughter of Nigeria, uh, a number of times 
went and met with different delegations, spoke about, we showed the film, spoke about what's happening on the ground, why it's so important, and how much uh, Brazil would have to change if this law were to pass. And there was just a number of steps in Copenhagen, in Brussels. We had a huge screening the day before the vote. We had breakfast with a number of parliamentarians. We had over 150 members of parliament who saw the film and who were moved by it. And in the pre in the pre vote debate, I think four different parliamentarians, members of European Parliament, spoke specifically about the film and what they were inspired. And the vote passed. And um, in the next couple of days or next couple of weeks, they'll be finalizing the language and signing it into law. And it's a huge step forward. And the most kind of amazing part of this is seeing how that's actually come back and affected things in Brazil. There's a, a huge agri, there's a woman who is a huge agribusiness. Um, like she, she owns all these farms. She owns these different processing plants and she was a huge Bolsonaro supporter and ahead of the elections, she came out and endorsed the competing candidate against Bolsonaro. She came out against Bolsonaro saying Bolsonaro has brought too much. He's gone too far in, just, in destroying the environment. He has made us a pariah. These laws that people are, you know, outside countries are enacting to fight against what's happening here are hurting us. Bolsonaro is too extreme. We can't be this extreme. And so on both sides, you see the influence of these laws. And, and I think they're going to make, um, you know, Brazil have to figure out how to really clamp down on these, you know, supply chains originating from from indigenous genocide. And I also wanted to ask you that uh, I what I liked about this documentary was also that it was showing the sign, side of an invader too. I mean, there was a man who was trying to uh, create a land for himself because he wanted to earn money. He needed to earn money. So also, uh, I think uh, it shows a great uh, part of this um, uh, this uh, problem we're facing. Many people doesn't really maybe want to go and burn forests or just uh, to try to find a place to uh, just earn their uh make their crops and earn money many people wouldn't maybe wanted to do that but some part of uh some part of communities are really need to earn money so they maybe go out and they uh, in a way they unfortunately destroy forest uh, to uh, make a land for themselves i also wanted to know your opinion about this because we can we can look to this situation in two different point of views, through the indigenous, indigenous people's point of views and through people who are searching for land and money, maybe. Of course. The the original impetus to go speak to them came from Bitte and the Uruwa community. They said a lot of journalists come here and they talk to us, talk to the activists, they never talk to the other side. And if you want to understand where this is coming from, like, we're just defending ourselves. Like, if you want to understand where this comes from, if you want to understand the root of this violence, you have to go see not just, like, how they operate, but what's their ideology. Mm -hmm. That's what's driving this. They think that they're the heroes in their own story. And I think that there's a, a certain truth to that, and that there was a narrative that uh, the Brazilian state really championed these frontier settlers to go in. And there's this very, very similar mentality as an American to the mentality that the colonial mentality that was happening in the mid 1800s in my country, where there was a, a celebration and empowerment of turning land, which is useless, into property. And, you know, it's very sort of lucky an idea. And the it was really important for us to be able to get inside of these uh, invading and settler groups, because the way that they think is that they think the, the you know, indigenous people have, are not there are not that many of them in population and they have too much land and they're holding me back economically and i think it's important to recognize that people like sergio and people like martins in the film are themselves poor they're they're working they're they're workers without land um and but they are the tip of the spear and they go out and and they have that narrative what i would counter argue is that the people who have too much land, who are too few in population and have way too much land, are the mega ranchers. They're the ones who control all the land that's already been converted. You could have plenty of land if it was more productive and if it was better distributed for everyone 
to be productive. You know, you don't have to cut down a single tree to have everyone be able to farm and subsist and also prosper. The problem is that there's this kind of racist narrative. They see indigenous people as the ones holding them back. And so I think what we're trying to also bring in this film is showing that it's poor people against poor people and rich people benefit. It's it's exactly the scenario where they like to, you know, the wealthy landowners who are mostly politicians like to pit poor people against each other and use these poor landless farmers to do their own dirty work. They're the ones who go and do the illegal cutting. They're the ones who go in and have to get into violent entanglements with indigenous people because they know that as soon as that land is cleared, they can come in and buy it. And so this is just a way that land gets further consolidated and the rich get even more land and even richer. And hopefully what we show through the film is that these are two groups that really should be working together. They shouldn't be in a war with each other. They should be looking for better ways to have land distributed for the benefit of working people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point uh, for the audiences who will watch this documentary. And I also wanted to know that your uh, production process, because I mean, you have to also go to Amazon and you've been in a different uh, kind of land. And I think in when we look at a director's or producer's point of view, uh, I guess it shouldn't be easy, right? I mean, you must <laughs> struggle while trying to create uh, all this uh, documentary. Well, the film was made completely independently with no money. I mean, we were we we raised a lot of money through grants, and we raised eventually money to finish the film. But we were always struggling to do this professionally and protect the community and be able to do this safely with you know robust security protocols, and also to be able to to have the team that we needed to be on both sides of this conflict and covering it over almost four years, you know, three and a half years, um, just really just cobbling grants together and being um, as sort of lightweight as possible as a team. It was a really, really challenging production. I mean, I think that there was some, it was, it was incredibly joyful. We were able to, um, you know, create really long lasting relationships because it took so long and was so slow and the trust really pays off. But at the same time, you know, I don't want to give away the film if anyone hasn't seen it, but you know, one of our dear friends is murdered in the process of making the film. It was incredibly hard for everybody. Um, you know, we definitely had moments where we thought about just, you know, giving up. I think that the, um, yeah, the 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 goal for us all along was to capture the nuance of this and not try to reduce it into simple black and white terms. And so, the access, everything was really slow, and but also. I don't know if there's anything I would necessarily change um, because I think it had to be slow. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I don't think that uh, this kind of impactful documentary could be uh, be done in like a couple of months uh, because uh, like you said, I guess there has to be a long period of time just to connecting with all the people out there and then later on the shooting process starts. And so to be able to give the reality of that uh, situation out there, I guess that time was needed. So uh, that's- We shot with so many other people who we ended up not including in the film, like so many other storylines. We just had so much tape. We really wanted to be rolling whenever anything happened. And so we were just, we had a mountain of footage. We really uh, kind of, <laughs> we really, uh, yeah, had an intense production workflow. So do you have any other plans? Like you said, uh, you're uh, creating a, a production uh, possibilities for uh, the community, but also do you have any uh, any other plans in furthermore to pursue this uh, project and talk about the Amazon? Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to Washington, D actually I'm going tonight to Washington, D.C., and tomorrow we'll be meeting with members of Congress um, in the United States to also push for a similar law as what we've kind of accomplished in, in Europe with partners and also do something similar here and try to help push that forward. Um, we will be doing a lot of different, you know, all throughout next year, we'll be trying to do a lot of kind of distribution throughout the Amazon, community screenings, I'm going on tour, taking the film out 
to the Amazon, to both sides, you know, to indigenous communities, but also to settler communities, trying to create space for conversation around how to improve sort of land tenures um, in the Amazon. I think that that for the next while we're going to be we're still quite committed to this to this team to this project to these collaborations. I'm really excited that the construction is underway. There's a lot of um, work to be done with the incoming uh, new administration under Lula. There's a lot of promises that he's been making to the indigenous movement that uh, he needs to keep, and I think a lot of political pressure to to make sure that that you know those commitments are real and and that there's progress. And I think that that the film by being on both sides of the conflict also provides an opportunity to create space for conversations across what is otherwise a very, um, uh, you know, violent and difficult divide. So we're going to continue to work with the film um, as long as there is an audience. Well, great, great. I, I, when I'm talking with directors and producers, I always feel that uh, it's really great, especially people who are involved in these areas, people who are pursuing human rights and, and environmental rights. I think it's really, really important to continue your work after the project is done because uh, these problems are not uh, going away immediately. So it's really important to pursue to pursue uh, the right roads uh, to be able to um, just pre prevent uh, the um, unfortunately or the awful effects of uh, all these um, problems but I guess uh, by pursuing all these with with art and with uh, documentaries with films and also with people like you who are, who are going to the site and just being there and be co connected with all the Congress and also with the, all the communities, I think it's it's really really important. So thank you for your all of all for your contributions, I guess. So and mm -hmm. thank you for being here with us today and good luck with all all your process. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll just mention there is a for anyone who is interested in getting involved, we have an impact website. It's just the territory impact. Dot org. There's different ways to get involved. There's different ways to support different, uh, you know, different organizations within the indigenous movement, both in Brazil and globally. And if there's anything that we, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're trying to to create partnerships and collaborations to, to you know, move this issue forward. So hopefully we'll be hearing from some of you. And and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thank you for joining us again. And I hope to see you soon in uh, other projects. And uh, I hope we can talk again. Me too. I'm excited. <laughs> Bye.